All right, can you start off by uh, stating and spelling your name? Uh, my name is Mark Petersdorf. I spell last name P-E-T-E-R-S-D-O-R-F-F. -E -E and Mark with a K. Okay. Um, you just look at me, you know, the word up there. So what brings us out here today? Uh, we are at the World War II Recreated in Dixon, Illinois. Uh, this weekend we brought out some of our uh, bigger toys to help support the event. Uh, the piece behind me is a self-propelled anti-tank gun. It's called a Hetzer. Uh, loosely translated as Little Troublemaker. And then you own this piece of equipment? I do. I'm one of the owners. There's uh, three of us. Oh, okay. So it's a, it's a group thing. Are you guys all reenactors? We are. Okay. We are. Um, all three here, by chance? Or uh, no. No. Two of us are here. One of us couldn't make it. Yeah, they have like special training on how to drive this thing and move it around. Uh, it, <laughs> it helps. Uh, I was in the army, okay. so I had uh, I dealt with armor, so I did have some experience with armor before. And the other two individuals uh, have operated construction equipment, and this essentially just drives like a bulldozer. It's just a fully enclosed bulldozer with no heat, no air conditioning, no power brakes, no power steering. And uh, this is this is a German tank. It is. Okay. It is. This is a, a German design, Czechoslovakian built. Okay. Um, so sitting, I mean, I'm curious how the steering wheel is. It's a T-bar, isn't it? Uh, actually, it's two levers. Oh, it, two it, if you had operated a bulldozer, you would be very comfortable operating this. <laughs> uh, just no visibility. <laughs> um, so what's it like being inside of this um, historic piece of equipment and being able to maneuver it? Um, what's that mean to you? Uh, to, honestly, to drive it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, you're actually doing the job that uh, you need to do. You're operating the vehicle. Uh, what it means to me, uh, honestly, at start, it was just for giggles. Uh, couldn't afford an American tank, so I bought a German one. So that pretty much dictated the uniform. Uh, we had to rebuild it, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, but now, you know, thinking about all the, I've had an opportunity to talk to some veterans, German veterans that actually operated armored vehicles, and after hearing those stories and uh, a lot of other stuff piecing together, uh, you know, going into uh, a fight with this thing took a lot of grit. You know, it took a lot of grit to do anything during the war. Uh, we didn't, they didn't have the technology we had, so everything was Armstrong steering. Uh, if you wanted to push in the clutch, you would needed to push in the clutch. It, it's it's not powered. It's all leg, and uh, it gives you appreciation for the, the guys that actually had to crew these vehicles. And um, you said that you uh, you have to meet some of the Germans that um, were part of this when it actually happened. Um, what what is that experience like? Um, for you and for them, did they come to a reenactment and watch it, or how how did this go? We uh, was 20 years ago now. We uh, read a reenactment in Michigan, and uh, there was an individual there that kind of wandered over, older guy, and uh, <laughs> the the first words out of his mouth was uh, pointed to the divisional symbol. Uh, the trident on the other side of the vehicle, and uh, with a, a thick German accent, he tapped it with his cane. He said, "Do you know what this is?" Well, the accent keyed us in really quick, and half a dozen of us mobbed him. Yes, we do. The important question is, do you? It was my division. So we actually have a second Panzer division uh, veteran who still does come out occasionally. He's 94. Uh, still full of vinegar, uh, a lot of fun. Oh, the insults are legendary. Uh, obviously, we are larger than German soldiers during the war, both height and girth. And he loves to, uh, 
uh, we have a special relationship. He's a lot of fun. But he's also uh, an amazing wealth of information. Uh, he didn't crew this particular type of vehicle. He crewed a turreted vehicle. But the, the stories are heartbreaking. Uh, some of them, you know, you don't want to be drinking anything because you're, you're going to have it coming out your nose. Uh, they're hysterical. Absolutely hysterical. And, um, and other ones, again, heartbreaking and you're almost crying listening to what these people had to go through. Were they Germans? Yes. But you know what? They're still human. Yeah. And I'm sure with, with knowing some of the things that he was able to tell you, I'm sure it probably translates into what you're doing now. Is that it does. It does. Uh, it, it allows us to use some of the actual gun commands and to operate the vehicle. Uh, it brings a, a, a higher level of authenticity. Uh, and we're able to impart that knowledge to the newer reenactors coming in. Uh, we have also had the privilege of speaking to an American veteran who actually fought against these vehicles. Uh, and that was, I, I can't say what he told us about it on camera or around women, children, and several uh, uh, other people, but it was uh, the stories that he came out on how lethal these vehicles were and the way they were employed also brought a new level of appreciation of what we have and how we use it. If you want the vehicle history, uh, it's it's nothing spectacular. It never saw combat. Oh, this, this one never saw combat? No. Okay. Is there a, a certain permit you guys have to have ah, to okay. be able to... Uh, to no. Uh, this uh, is classified as a salute cannon. Uh, it's BATF approved. Uh, it's been, it will never fire a live round again. There's several things wrong and if somebody's silly enough to actually find one and do something stupid, it this will explode. It's demilled. Yeah, it's, uh, the term is demilled demilitarized. Uh, the adaptation we've made inside allows us to fire a black powder charge and uh, it's it's a powerful charge. Uh, we work diligently to make sure there's nobody in front of us when it goes off. Yes it's a blank but there's a lot of gas behind it and it will hurt you. So uh, our uh, American counterparts and the other individuals that uh, we do engage on the battlefield, we're all cognizant of each other's vehicles. So from the crowd's perspective, it looks like we're actually uh, firing something at our target. Actually, we're not. We're off to the side. So if anything does come out of the barrel, uh, the, the paper towel wadding that we use or you know a piece of rust or something, it's not actually aimed at somebody. Mm -hmm. The infantry that uh, are coming against us know how powerful this is, so they make a diligent effort to stay away from the front, and if there's new reenactors on their side, they educate them. And our infantry also is keeping watch out to make sure that uh, my movement area is clear. Uh, I can't see anything out of the driver's scope, which is what's behind me. Uh, if I was sitting in the vehicle now, I could see from about the middle of your chest up. Uh, the commander of the vehicle, who uh, has his head sticking out all the time, uh, he's the one who's dictating the movements of the driver. He's the safety. He's looking around constantly and he's taking feedback from uh, the infantry and reenactors around him and other safety aspects. Reenacting units uh, as a whole um, work diligently with each other and other and the new reenactors, especially, to give an appreciation of just you know what this is this is a hobby, but it's a dangerous one. You know you have a rifle in your hand, you have a blank in that rifle, and that blank does produce a lot of gas. You know, and these exponentially more. So it is dangerous. Accidents do happen. You know, there's misfires, there's hang fires, there's uh, different things that can happen, and we actually do train to mitigate it. We take it upon ourselves. All right, what happens if it doesn't go off? You know, now we have a black powder charge and a 14-foot steel pipe that we need to make safe. How do we do that? And we've taken measures to work on a process to mitigate that danger and dispose of it. Is there any chance where um, you can just give me like a quick walk around and show me what oh, yeah. it's all about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll just leave your microphone on and I'll just follow you around. All right. We have water bottles over here on the side. So go on this side. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll just stay on this side. Uh, 
front of the vehicle. Uh, 75 millimeter main gun, high velocity. Uh, this will poke a Sherman, will kill a Sherman at a mile. Uh, the front slope is three inches slabs. Uh, a Ger uh, Sherman with a 75 millimeter gun cannot penetrate the front armor. A 76 millimeter gun Sherman has to be within 100 yards. And if we can kill that vehicle at a mile, it's disparaging. Uh, continue around the side. This is a blackout driving light for convoy. It essentially illuminates the fender, and with all the noise and the fender illuminated, it basically tells people to get out of the way, I'm coming. I can't see you, but you can see me. Uh, road wheels, very large diameter road wheels, gives us a very smooth ride. Uh, top speed of this vehicle on a flat, hard road is 35 miles an hour, which for a World War II vehicle is incredibly fast. This did not see combat during the war. Uh, this was used by the Swiss after the war. They bought 142 of them. But unfortunately, before they, we got it, they used it as a target. Uh, this is one of the holes that did go through, but we put a steel plate on the inside to keep the bees out. It's amazing how fast you can get out when there's a hornet's nest in there. Uh, but this is what a bazooka type round would do. Everything is melted through. You can see part of the standoff blast, and it came in in this direction. Uh, there were other holes in them, but we fixed them because we needed to. They were quite large. Uh, on top is a uh, remote control uh, machine gun uh, with an MG34 belt fed machine gun. It had a 50 round capacity and a drum, but if the crew needed that, they had already screwed up. The infantry was too close. The armor on the side is three quarters of an inch, so it's very thin. Uh, top and bottom is quarter inch. Uh, from the side, an American 50 caliber will make Swiss cheese of me. So from the front, I'm all big and bad. Hey, look at me. But from the side, I'm a big chicken, and I'm going to run away. Uh, skirts on the sides to uh, basically uh, give the crew false hope. <laughs> it was, uh, these are designed to detonate bazooka-type rounds on the lower hull because it is a more vertical surface. But in practicality, uh, if there's a bazooka coming at your side, you're already done. We did have a full set, but unfortunately, elm trees are our nemesis. Uh, from the rear, this is how you gain access to the vehicle. There's a hatch just in front of the remote control machine gun. They have three crew members crawl down. To the front is the driver. In the middle of the vehicle is the uh, gunner. And to the rear, on this side, is the loader. And they are literally chest to back. There's very, very little room in here. Uh, right now, Tom is pulling out uh, an example of the 75 millimeter ammunition. There were 42 of those carried inside the hull. Uh, it was so tight with ammunition inside, there was no room for personal storage. So they would stow their backpacks and whatever uh, else they needed on the back of the vehicle. If they stored it on the side, typically it was torn off by trees. Uh, the other hatch that uh, Tom is in the process of closing is access for the commander. That's his position. Uh, he doesn't even get a seat. Uh, he stands or squats most of the time, and uh, he's the safety of the vehicle. He makes sure everything goes well and uh, tells the gunner when to uh, actually fire the main gun, make sure everybody's clear. Uh, the exhaust, access to the uh, engine, spare track what's left of it, and uh, a lot of oil stains from uh, the maintenance we had to pull uh, to fix a blown oil line the last two years.